Okay, this is fall 2018, week one is T204, uh, and we are doing this digital energy chapter one. Uh, first, we want to talk about uh, energy and cost, and what is that has to do with us in energy systems, and how is that relate to residential energy. Uh, we want to get some awareness of where do we stand. Again, uh, we're all aware of uh, climate change in a way. Some areas are hotter, some areas are colder, and uh, it's a global thing. And some towns like San Diego started to have ACs while they never had ACs. Some towns here in Massachusetts never needed to have air conditioning, now they're thinking about it. Some areas are getting some extreme heat and extreme cold. And uh, we have to adapt. And our consumption for energy is getting higher. And our role here as technicians depends, uh, they depend on the energy system, uh, the energy world depends on us to be able to reduce consumption. Uh, there, was, there used to be a time when energy was cheap and the demand wasn't as high and we used to consume way too much. That's why you see all the ACs consume a lot of energy and they don't produce much. And you can buy a newer AC now, it consumes half the energy and uh, Cost even less than that. So, climate change is happening. Is how do we adapt to it? Is uh, our survival depend on? Uh, we want to find ways to cut down energy consumption. Uh, so we can go to the bare necessity. What do we need? Uh, we can't afford to have walls, thin walls that leak energy all the time. Uh, energy becoming more expensive, and there's more demand. We had to shut down, shut down the school yesterday because the school couldn't keep up with the energy consumption. It was too hot. So that tells you something about the efficiency of the system. So, and I think again, it's global, and the planet has seven billions of people in it. If everybody turned their ACs and their heat, it's going to be an issue. And again, we don't want to be uncomfortable. Like, yes, I'm all about climate change and green energy and whatnot, but I also want to be cold. Want to be eating food that's not spoiled, okay? So let's keep, let's uh, have a nice sweet spot, okay? Let's have our standard the way we want it, but just be uh, so, uh, stopping all the leaks and stopping all the, the waste, which is possible. So that's where we come in. Uh, home energy. So if we if you go to the past before we had the industrial revolution and all this cheap energy and air conditioning and combustion engines. Uh, there used to be people who lived here for a long time, thousands of years. In New England, they didn't have heaters, they didn't have air conditioning. There used to be people living in the Sahara Desert. They had the Kamat Desert in Chile and they managed. So how did they do that? Granted, they were not as much and they were living, some of them were living nomadic life, so they moved. But there were some who were here for the entire seasons. So they they did it. And it was some basic things that they did. The material selection of the house, the orientation of the house, whether they go uphill or downhill. So there are some ways where we can adopt where you live. Uh, some, some tribes, they travel to the mountains in the summertime to it's cooler. And the winter, they go down to the valley. So there are some ways you can manage your uh, heating and cooling. There are a few houses here in Massachusetts that are completely passive heating and cooling. What does that mean? They're heated and cooling and cooled based on the atmosphere, based on ventilation. They soak up the heat from the sun and they store the heat through the night and they keep cool during the winter. Why? Because they're well built and they put a lot of care into selection, selecting the materials for those houses. I think there are two in Westfield, and uh, two other things in Lovell or something. But it is possible if you put some care into your house that you might not, you do not even need to put AC or a heater. No, it's not as much, maybe half. I will show you how. Sometimes the trees you put around your house make a difference. The venting make a difference. The location of the windows make a difference. You can, you can have two houses in the same neighborhood that can soon, one of them will consume three times one of the other in the same neighborhood just by the material selection, orientation, and small tricks. Uh, 
again, there used to be a time in the 60s and 70s when they had the whole uh, housing boom and people just did not care. Just want to bump houses fast and quick, as soon as possible, and they did not care. And they will oversize a unit, instead of putting two tons, we'll put four tons and just like skimp on the wall insulation. Uh, luckily, there are laws now against that, and if your house is very leaky and consumes a lot of energy, that they might not let you uh, rent the house out. So, location, wild color houses, you see that in uh, southern Spain, or in Greece, that make a big difference. If you live in a hot area, it makes, makes sense to have like, light color to reflect the heat. Most of our heat comes from the sun. And if you notice now, houses get here very, very hot, especially in the attic area, because the roofs here are black, which serves well, very well during the winter time, because it sucks up the heat and not the ice. But uh, in the summertime now, it's cooler outside than inside, if the house is really badly designed. And the attic now will ventilate. But my attic now is 120 degrees, even though it's 90 outside. So the color makes a big difference. <coughs> Chimney effect. Uh, we talked about that maybe a little when we did the combustion control course, uh, which basically using natural convection to move hot air upward. Naturally, hot air rises. So, if you put a vent on top of your house, probably you can vent all your hot air outside naturally and produce a current without without any fans. So putting the right vents, the vent can air out your house and can cool it down. And the air coming into your house from the ground level, is it hot or cool? It's cool usually, right? And did you notice that the shade under the tree is much cooler than the shade under a wall? If you're a hiker, don't you feel much cooler being in, in the wood than being in the shade outside. Why is that? Yeah, what, what, what do the trees do? Give us sunlight and what, what else? That's two and what else? Huh? That's two, what else? Okay, what else? Why is that shade under a tree is at least 20 degrees? It respirates too. Yes. It, the trees respirate. They soak up the water from the ground and they evaporate it. And what happens when you evaporate water? You cool the heat off. So when you have grass, when you have trees around your house, probably this air is much cooler than the, the street air. Yeah. And when you open the windows in the first floor, you're gonna get that air in. Uh, where is the coolest part of your house? Basement. Basement, why? It's also close to the ground. If you go 10 yards deep, to the ground, the temperature is constant all year round. Oh, no, no, never mind, never mind. It's 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 meter, uh, 10 meter, which is 10 yards <coughs> down, all year round. So one can think I'll make a room in there and just like get some 50 degrees and just circulate that through the house and get free air conditioning. And if you go to some uh, some of the big uh, mansions in uh, Newport, Ferrari, you see that they have the least ventilation required because they have good circulation. So there's a lot of things you can do. The material selection is a new thing now that has been introduced into the the, the field. The, the walls, the insulation, the roofs, the shingles, the doors, it all make, make, makes a difference. Like if you look in the, some African huts, so some Native Americans' houses made out of mud mixed with hay. Mud is good in storing energy, and hay also provides some kind of insulation. Uh, stones are good in some areas, but it does also store a lot of heat. So there are some houses that will be exposed to heat during the day, and during the night will release it slowly. Uh, there are new materials now where you can have bricks filled with wax. The wax will melt during the day and will solidify during the night. It's kind of like a, a mean to store energy. So, industrial revolution happened and we had the cost of cheap energy. Uh, there used to be a time when 
you can fill your tank with less than a dollar. It's completely cheap. And at that time, we did not care much about uh, how much oil we consume. Uh, it took us a while to understand how much uh, freon or refrigerant affect the environment. We didn't care much. Out of ignorant, of some element of greed as well. You know, it's like free and it's there, it's like it's more and more. But uh, we're getting more awareness now, and people are getting some evidence that we cannot keep consuming this much this fast. Luckily, things happened with the uh, ozone layer and uh, freon, and they stopped all this uh, excess consumption. However, we had, uh, if, you do, if you look at the cost from the 70s or 80s, there were like V8 and V12, and there was a lot of gas, and probably have to fill the big tank every day. That was part of consumption. And even if you look at boilers, and uh, ACs made in that area, it was really huge. Also fridges. But it was not an element of the design. We did not design for uh, efficiency. Design for performance, for more uh, for uh, performance and more uh, bigger sizes. Uh, now we design more for like efficiency. If you look up uh, like take any car manufacturer timeline and start in the 60s, car were bigger. Then in the 80s was more about like more performance, uh, more comfort. In the 90s, people start to think about quality. Car quality. The car didn't last as long. Everything has to be changed very quickly. But in the 90s was the age of quality where every car manufacturer thought about making the car more reliable. And in the 2000, early 2000s, what was the focus? Energy consumption. And it got even like more right now they have minimum APGs for each car. Which makes sense. And there's a lot of improvement in there if they just put some thought into it. But uh, it was not the focus, every time they took the focus. So the just came in the 1980s, light bulb came in the 1900 or so. Uh, the world's first uh, power station at that time, 1908, 8% of Americans' homes had electricity. That's it, 8%. That's very really small. <coughs> So it was not that big, the consumption was not that huge. But uh, everybody wants this luxury of having electricity, and uh, it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. To be able to survive in, uh, in a place that's too hot, too cold, you need some electricity. In the 1925, it was 50%, half the American had electricity, which means more power stations, more <coughs> transmission, and more distribution. So, 1930, natural gas started. That's very recent. Now it's 50% as our source for heating and also power generation. Uh, how do you think we generate power now from this day? What is our. Huh? Solar. No. Yeah. Uh, what fuel do we use? Coal, natural gas. What is the most dominant? is still king. It's not history, guys. You said so? I'm sorry. Most of the coal. So it's coal. The coal is 70% and it's getting less. And uh, that's in the entire world. In China and in Europe, even in Germany, they're still trying to get rid of coal. But coal is king because it has very high energy density, which means a small amount of coal can give you a lot of heat and give you a lot of energy. So until this day, until this day, we still burn coal to make electricity. Coal make heat. With heat, we boil water. We use that water to make steam. Uh, that uh, water to make steam. The steam we turn on a turbine. So the turbine we turn on a generator, and we have electricity. This has not changed for the last hundred years. It's been the same way. It's more efficient. It's better, but still the same way. There are still people, miners, in the Appalachian Trail or this area of Virginia where they go and dig. Even in New Jersey, even in Connecticut, there are coal mines where some person will go and dig for coal and they sell it by the pounds and you burn it and make electricity. So this is still the practice until this day. Even in the modern world, 
maybe in like, uh, Western Europe or China. However, we're trying to transition from coal to natural gas, which is better, but it's not as abundant. And again, the key word is energy density. You didn't get as much heat out of it as much as coal. And uh, we're trying also to transition to, into solar, wind turbines, <coughs> and hydro. They're all, they're all alternative sources, they're viable. However, based on the demand we have right now, and the growth of this demand, it's not possible to cover that and within 50 years, unless we come with some solutions. They are there, there are a lot of solutions there. However, I'm not gonna get political, but there's a lot of people invested in these businesses. So let's uh, transition slowly. And actually, a lot of big companies like Shell, ExxonMobil, BP are trying to diversify a little bit so they can withstand that transition. And there's a lot of uh, great minds in this country and a lot of <coughs> places who are, who are thinking and aware of what are the other possibilities we can do. There are people like you guys who are coming up with a lot of great tools. I saw in a, in a conference last year where three guys on the age in their 20s and they were like, uh, they started to buy a diesel company. They're their own biodiesel company based in Massachusetts where they go and collect all the all the oil from the fast food chains and they refine it and sell it to people. So we'll talk about that. I mean you can use uh, use cooking oil to to uh, make energy and run power plants. Uh, today eighty percent of homes are AC and it's getting more and more. Uh, everybody wants an AC now because it's getting hotter. It's not the same. You get some hot days and it's uh, and ACs are getting cheaper to install. It's not as expensive as it used to be, so it's there. Uh, nobody is supposed to be like deprived from these kind of uh, comparable things in life, like the AC and fridge and appliances. But let's make them more efficient and make them more smart so we can sustain their operation. In the US alone, that's still the same, maybe it's already growing. The US is 5% of the world population. However, the consumption is 25% of the world supply. So you see the, the imbalance there. We're only 5% of the pop world population. However, we're consuming one quarter of the world energy. So there is something that a little bit has to be done about here. We're all the same. We all have the same needs. We just have to alter a little bit the way we think of things. If you go to Europe, for example, these uh, countries like the Scandinavian countries, Germany, Poland, Austria, they they live the same lifestyle that we have. They have uh, fridges, they have cars, but it's just the way they they use it. And uh, sometimes you have to have some kind of uh, regulation to to alter the consumption. Like the manufacturer is not going to give you an efficient fridge unless he has to. He wants to make his own profit. If he wants to sell you a fridge for a thousand dollar, if it costs him three hundred, that's good. But if he can sell it for a thousand dollar, it has to cost him three uh, seven hundred dollars. That's less profit for him. But somebody has to tell shoot the standards high. So they have the same fridges, just like it's more efficient. They have the same power machines, but they're just more efficient. So somebody has to set the standards and. Uh, Again, nobody wants to hear that, oh yeah, I, I gotta have less, so I wanna be less comfortable, nobody wants to hear that, but let's make it more efficient and make it more, more reasonable. Uh, still people wanna drive big cars, they wanna like, enjoy it, it's fun, people wanna do race cars and whatever, but nobody's doing that every day, you know what I mean? Like, I, I've, seen some, I've seen some people who have really big, huge cars, like, oh yeah, I drive in the weekend, you know? I have my allowances of gas, I'm, I'm not consuming more than anybody else. I used to enjoy it. I mean, we still have one, the freedom of want to just have, to have moderation in it. So there's a big consumption over here. And there are some things you can do, and that's my job and your job one day is to do small alteration in a house that will not be noticeable by the resident, but it does make a lot of difference. That's what we're after. Again, we don't want people to be uncomfortable. <coughs> we want to do small mod modification here and there that will keep the house or the resident running the way it's supposed to and still be more efficient. Uh, it is doable. It is very doable. 
uh, about the fiction, global warming, climate change. It's a big argument. Uh, I'm not here to argue that, but climate change is happening, whether the human are the cause of it or not, that's an up for debate, but the fact that there is climate change is happening, and everybody agrees with that. And you can see that yourself, that some uh, seas are becoming hotter than others, and some seas are colder than it used to be. We have we have been seeing uh, temperature highs and lows records for the last three years. So it is happening, and uh, our survival as human race depends <coughs> on our adaptability. We just have to know how to adapt and how to accommodate that change. Uh, the use of greenhouse gases. What are greenhouse gases? We hear about that all the time. <coughs> carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, all those gases that absorb and keep heat. That's the problem. We have too many of those things, gases that absorb and keep heat, which is not good. And that would make the, our climate and our atmosphere is more rich of those gases that will keep on heat into emitting it back to the space. So we have a lot of uh, increase between the 1990s and 2000, and it keeps increasing. And we're trying to uh, reduce the greenhouse gases. And uh, when you take the EPA test, you'll see how long it took for the group of scientists to convince governments that ferrion is bad for the environment, and we are depleting our ozone, and we all gonna die of cancer. And nobody believed it for a long time. And it took a lot of effort and a lot of uh, collaboration between countries to actually go on there and scan the hole, actually guys, there's a hole, and we are causing this hole. By the time they being able to come to an agreement and stop the Freon, luckily it wasn't too late. And luckily that hole was in the location where nobody lives, in the South Pole. So nobody's there, okay, it's still there by the way, it's small, but it's still there, but luckily nobody lives there. So it takes a while for people to be convinced that there's a problem. And it's really hard to, it's really easy, it's really hard for me to be convinced that I'm causing climate change and this is my bread and butter. You know, I'm trying to produce oil and you're telling me like I have to cut it down because I'm causing, I'm gonna be in denial. So I, you gotta understand that, it's really hard. It's really hard to tell somebody your boiler, by the way, is very inefficient and you have to change it when the new boiler costs $10,000. You know, I can, it's, it'll be easier to say, hey, your boiler is causing a lot of money However, I can get you some kind of rebate and get you a new world for free. Or I will list you for a hundred bucks for that amount. I'll be more convinced that this world is bad for the environment. Otherwise, no, I don't think it's bad for the environment. It will be easier for me to change my car that's like a V8 and burning a lot of gas, but it's running for free because I have no payments on it. You give me a new car, give me something. I can't buy 20,000 new cars tomorrow, you know? It's, it's easy to convince me this way, you know what I mean? <laughs> if I give you a free hybrid, will you take it? I'll take it. <laughs> free, you'll take it. <laughs> so it depends. So again, money is always an issue. And it's easy to convince somebody to, to buy into the idea if it doesn't cost them a lot of impact. At the end, uh, everybody wants to be comfortable. Yeah, they're horrible. <laughs> So, what about imports impact on the economies? Again, <coughs> that's another issue. When it comes to import and export, it comes to like uh, coal and uh, products. Uh, the resources we have right now are very <coughs> sustainable for our growth, and that's again a fact. And what to do about it is uh, a big issue. It's not for us to discuss. We just want to be aware of it. But the, our growth and demand for energy is not sustainable for our resources. We have to find new resources. And granted, we can keep the consumption we have of fossil fuel as is right now, but to, to subsidize the new growth, we have to find new alternatives. And ideally, we want those new alternatives to be green or renewable. And it's very, very possible. The improvement on wind turbines and solar has been really Great, so it's doable. Uh, the progress in renewable is slow, but it's getting much better. Uh, at least here in Mass, I've seen a lot of people putting solar panels. 
the prices are reasonable and you can put them in for free. And some companies will come and put them on your house for free and they'll pay you. So it's becoming more, there are more and more incentives. Uh, another question. What is renewable energy? What do you consider as a renewable energy? Uh, the sun, it's always there. It's not gonna end for our, at least our existence as a human race. The sun's gonna be there for billions of years. So the sun is renewable because it's there. What else? Water. Water is renewable. Water is always gonna be running. Wind is renewable because wind is caused by the sun. It's always going to be there. Two level, two level, five class. Yeah. I just registered. It's okay. Just come back tomorrow. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be there for a while. What else? Zero. What? Zero point. What is your point? We're well, trying to pull it out of the package. Okay. I don't know about that. It's new one. Okay, maybe. I don't know. What about natural gas? Is it renewable? Why? Natural gas is green because it has low emission, but it's not renewable. Because you're getting out of the ground. <coughs> but you can think of it as renewable because you can make <coughs> farmers are making gas out of uh, cow manure. So you can think of it as renewable. Out of fermentation, corn, biodiesel is renewable. You can grow it. Uh, ethanol is renewable. Yeah. So renewable is something you can always get back and make more of it. Green is zero emission. So is natural gas green? You burn it completely, maybe, but you still gonna get some combustion, CO2 out of it. So it's not really green, but it's renewable. What about uh, nuclear? Is it green? <coughs> That's a question. It's something fails. <laughs> it's something fails. It, it, it can be. Nuclear is awesome. But it's, uh, if it is done right, and it's, uh, the, the, when, when it leaks, it's a problem. You, you know that Fukushima reactor is still leaking, right? Absolutely. But you still hear about it. I don't know if they're still working on that. It's here already. It's here already. Yeah. 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 Should I go worry about it? Huh? Uh, not really. You can't do anything about it. You can't do anything about it. Until, until you grow a six finger, you know, and then think about it. <laughs> but, yeah, nuclear is great, and I'll be advocating for nuclear, but uh, again, the, it's disastrous when something happens. So, a lot of projects have been shut down. No, no more progress because of what happened in Fukushima. So, gas, we said gas is, uh, could be renewable. But definitely not green. We use like has emission. Wind. Geothermal is a great source, by the way, guys. I highly recommend that you get into geothermal because it's it's getting it's getting momentum here in New England. What is geothermal? Remember when I said ten minutes ago that if you dig deeper, like ten meters or so, yeah, it gets uh, stable. It will not change. You can use that and recycle it. And people are getting with some smart, genius ideas on how to make this uh, this uh, uh, recycling of air, recycling of air, cheaper and more economical. The only cost you get is circulation, pumping air or water in and out, uh, in and out of the ground. Okay. Solar. There are two types of solar. I'll talk about them next class. I think that's enough for now. Thank you very much.